Well, good morning everyone on this cold but dry 1st of December and this is my very first video or vlog, whatever you want to call it and it will be mainly about my very first R1250 GS, well my first GS in total <coughs> as for the last 40 years or so I've driven sports bikes or sports tourers so this is the R1250 Rally TE it is the low chassis version because I am a massive 5 foot 6 inches tall <coughs> which means I have to have something where I can comfortably get both feet on the ground which I can currently I have the suspension set in auto so it's low chassis but it's also got the low seat so in auto I prefer it that way because I'm comfortably got the balls of both feet on the ground I could lower it completely to what's called on this system minimum <coughs> but I've just got a feeling that might bottom out the suspension if I hit a bump or something like that as I said it's my very first GS let alone the R1250 and so far since oh, March March this year um, I've done a little over 4,000 miles in it which is actually more miles than I did on my ZZR 1100 in the three years that I owned it from you so we'll talk about my bike history which led me to the GS so my biking career started when I was 17 really joined the Air Force at 16 left Port Glasgow did my training first posting was RAF Kinloss on the Nimrod Major Servicing Unit free team if anybody's listening I was still only 16 and I bought my first motorbike which was a Yamaha DT250 and yes I know I was only 16 because I bought it as a bit of a doer upper because I couldn't afford a proper bike or a new one on a very little wage in 1980 so I bought a Yamaha DT250 did a load of work to it and get it on the road just at the point where I was 17 including the swing arm repair because whoever had it before me I don't know how they managed it or why they did it this the swing arm pivot bolt which as we all know should go all the way through and be attached by a nut at the other end somebody had removed that and they drifted in two separate bars meeting in the middle not attached in any way just meeting in the middle and I only knew that when I decided to take it all apart before I put it on the road as an aircraft engineer I thought I'll do a proper job and just inspect things before I go wind down the road which was fortunate for me so a new pivot bolt was purchased as well as other things a bit of a paint job thanks to the painters in the MU and I was on the road it still had knobbly tyres on it um, which I was not a fan of and never have been so when I was going around a corner try to treat it like it's like a sports bike or something it would just drift on one occasion to the opposite side of the road and I thought nah this is not for me it was great to go down Findorn on the beach but I wanted to drive it on the road so after three months I got rid of that made a bit of money on it because I'd done it up and I bought my first proper motorbike which was a six month old Yamaha RD250F black and yellow Kenny Roberts colours awesome bike I'm trying to find another one to restore but even a basket case you're looking at thousands of pounds so I had that for about a year-ish just a little bit over 
and I was posted to my first tour in Germany on 92 Squadron at Wildenrath and for anybody who's listening will know that what you get when you go to Germany is local overseas allowance which means on top of your pay you get extra money just for being in Germany so with that extra money no financial commitments the money I got every month in my pay was the money that um, was just for me to spend so I bought a Suzuki GS1000E my first big CC proper motorbike I had that for a few years went all over the place in it I was even posted back to the UK for my first course then onwards up to RAF Lucas in Dundee and I had to travel up to Scotland and uh, my GS1000E in the winter hail, sleet, snow, you name it it was chucked at me and that was coming back from Germany through Felixstowe all the way up Britain to Lucas somewhere in the region of 600 miles on a 1988 naked road bike due to lack of funds because you don't get paid a lot then in the Air Force my only gear consisted of a relatively old probably too old AGV helmet a poor quality leather jacket average gloves normal jeans and a set of boots you know the ones that you used to put white socks under and then tuck them over the top that was my biking gear in 1983 when I returned from Germany to Lucas the BMI fitters course probably the one and only time I've ridden along on a motorbike and cried with the pain because it was so cold so I got back went to 43 Squadron Ariat Lucas again on the Phantoms I was never a technician so I got paid more money still single no financial commitments Effectively I was quite well off in relative terms that is and I was deciding right I've had this GS1000 for a few years I think I'll upgrade and there's a couple of my mates at Lucas who rode motorbikes there's my mate Paul McCann he had a GPZ11 I think it was a B1 or a B2 and my other mate Tony Thompson now Tony did production racing he used to race uh, his Suzuki Katana which he had had a load of engine work done to make it go faster and be competitive Tony said to me because he knew I was going to get a new bike why don't you look at the new GPZ900 they've just come out and they're beating everything well I'd already set my heart on getting a GPZ1100 you know the Unitrack one with the sort of half fairing at the top I decided I was just going to get one of those and I tend to kind of stick with my plans but anyway <clears throat> I went to a launch evening for a Kawasaki at a bike shop in Dundee called Jack Gow's G-O-W and at the launch the launch night day sorry um, actually it might have been a night I think it was an evening job Ah uh, yeah, there was the GPZ305, if anybody can remember the belt driven ones. There was the GPZ750, I think there was also a GPZ750 turbo there. Uh, there was the ZZ, I oh, sorry, GPZ1100. And under a cover was the GPZ900. Lots of videos on about the bike, the GPZ900 that was. I'm sure we can probably all remember that launch. And then towards the end of that uh, evening, Jack Gow unveiled the GPZ900 and everybody was kind of in awe about it. I remember looking at it and thinking, oh I really like that, because it looked like a race bike, it was modern, 
and at that time it was the first motorbike you could buy from a shop, bog standard out of the crate, could do 150 plus miles an hour. So Jack Gow told me um, that he couldn't let me have a test drive of it because he had that was his personal bike and he was racing it in the Isle of Man a few months later. I was almost disappointed really thinking well I'm not going to spend I think it was £3,400 then in 1984 for a GPZ900 I'm not going to pay that sort of money without test riding it so Jack says well what we'll do is I'll take you on the back I mean the fact that he told me he was going to be racing it in the Isle of Man should have been a red flag to me about how fast he would go but I, I said yeah let's do that got an appointment came in the following weekend and I remember pulling up outside the bike shop in Dundee Jack Gow standing at the entrance to the workshop sees me, he waves, goes back into the workshop to get his gear and I wait outside a couple of minutes later he reappears and he's wearing if anybody can remember them brown dust coats that workshop mechanics and engineers used to wear in the old workshops so he's wearing a brown dust coat he had a piss pot helmet and a set of gauntlets <clears throat> and I remember thinking then what is the point in me going out on this motorbike which is so fast with an old duffer like him in a dust coat because at the time I think Jack probably would have been around well probably late 40s early 50s I could get I could be wrong but he was about that age I'm sure and I was only 20 so you know what it's like as far as I was concerned I knew everything so I get sort of back of this Jeep he's 100 still kind of disappointed and we set off and from that minute onwards I have never been so frightened in all my life because Jack Gow rode that GPZ 900 like he stole it considering the fact that he said he was actually trying to run it in because it had all this new anti-dive technology all that sort of thing it was brand new out of the box it kind of did everything it said it did and um, I remember going into corners at speed thinking I'm going to die because he's going far too quick we should be braking and inside my crash helmet I'm kind of almost screaming so 20-30 minutes later we get back to the bike shop in Dundee which I was actually quite relieved about because I hadn't crashed and been killed I was actually shaking when I got off of it and the first thing Jack said to me was sorry about couldn't go too quick because there's loads of police around here never been so happy in my life to hear those words that the police are around because I think if I went any quicker I'd have had to panic and attempt to let me off but anyway, based on that I bought one the GPZ 900 r what an awesome machine fast as anything smooth brilliant I've had a couple since then I've restored two, I've got one in my garage at the moment I've just finished the restoration on looks brand new spent a lot of time on it, quite a lot of money but I've had a few other bikes so after the GPZ900 I stopped for about oh, four or five years because I got married children started coming along, all that sort of thing but after about five years I got back on to biking again and this would have been about 1990, 1991 and I got another GPZ900 I've had a few I've had GPZ1000s I had a ZRX 1200 um, and I've had a couple of higher boosters and from 2012 I have been riding a number of ZZR 1400s but I'm sure anybody that's listening will understand when you think you're getting close to 60 your wrists start to hurt your back starts to hurt you're going to have to admit defeat and look at getting something a bit more sedate 
my mates at the time were riding GS's I used to go up with them they'd tell me how brilliant they were I'd ignore them because I thought they were an old man's bike and I'd continue with my ZZR I put handlebar uh, bar risers on it in an, in an effort to try and get to be a bit more comfortable that worked for a short while and um, it was still really hurting me so I decided to do a handlebar conversion so I approached a company in I think it's Yorkshire called Top Yokes UK and I bought a handlebar conversion kit for it converted it and initially it was brilliant really comfortable rider position even at 5 foot 6 it was good for me the only downside is the ZZR 1400 is a bit of a missile it doesn't take long before you're up into silly speeds and again at only 5 foot 6 I still was sitting above the level of the screen so I then it's, it's just getting buffeted because you're going so quick and you're no longer behind a screen so I had to look for an alternative um, having been badgered for a couple of years at this point by my mates I decided to test ride a GS because I've sat in my mates GS they've got normal size ones that's the only way to explain it standard, normal, quite tall and I remember sitting on it on the side stand and it, it just couldn't even get, couldn't touch the ground let alone tiptoes tried to push it up onto its wheels and I was like balancing and they had to hold it it's just far too tall for me and that's when I became aware because I wasn't up to that point there was such a thing called a low chassis version and effectively what they do is they, they shorten the monoshock I have also had and also has a lowered seat this one has got a rally seat which is at its lowest setting so I test rode it the first motorcycle I've ever bought that actually now fits me comfortably I can push it backwards or pull it backwards while sitting on it because I can get my feet firmly on the ground and um, we'll talk about the bike now then having had that history so as I said if I lower it fully on this switch here on the left you put it to minimum and if I put it to minimum I'm pretty much flat footed But I don't want to do that because I just I'm just not sure if you're at its minimum stroke and you hit a bump that it just might bottom out. I know it's automatic and it all does everything for you, but I've put it on the auto selection so it rises. You can feel when you go from minimum and select auto, you can feel it rising, and that puts me to the sort of balls of my feet, which I'm more than happy with, more than comfortable with. If I ever get in a position where I need to manoeuvre it backwards I'll either just get off it and pull it backwards or I'll get the system and I'll just put it to minimum and, and do it by sitting astride it <clears throat> Now in terms of handling I'll be honest, I was a bit sceptical I always viewed the GS as a bit of an old man's bike because you do see these people that ride around on them and they're like 90 years old they just don't look very sporting how wrong was I I've now had this bike for six months or so did just over 4,000 miles on it out on it on every opportunity I can even like today the roads are not too bad it's a little bit cold I've not even got the heated grips on but it is nine degrees and very recently as in I think it was the beginning of October I did a round trip down to Wales with a couple of my mates so two days, 650 miles 
off some roads, we managed to get into Wales and the sun came out and the roads around Wales I like Scotland really when the weather's good, they're just awesome and this thing could go into and come out of corners like I've never known and I'm not going to say it's as quick as my ZZR 1400s because it's clearly not it is not as nimble through the corners however it is more than capable I've got the standard tyres on at the moment I intend to fit a set of Road, road 5 trials trails and that's a recommendation from somebody as well as looking at reviews on YouTube and that will be in preparation for our planned trip to Picos de Europa next May group of six at the moment might climb to eight but at the moment currently there's six of us which is probably a good size group so we're doing the Picos de Europa we've managed to secure a villa as a base we'll do Plymouth Santander a couple of hours on the other side to the base and then days out from that base managed to get a really nice villa a room each and it's got its own underground garage so the bikes will be secure at night really looking forward to it and the only thing I would get for this now is I said um, those tyres because I want it to be a bit sticky tyres it's not going to go off road um, and then we'll see where we go now a bit more about the bike I've never rode a GS before pretty much every day for several weeks of having it I was just more and more surprised about what it would do and I know some people refer to them as tractors and stuff like that and part of me agrees with them because in comparison to a large inline 4 Japanese super smooth bike it is a tractor comparatively however it's got tons of grunt I even went off-road on it a couple of days ago um, I did try and video it but the disc got corrupted uh, and I came off because the tyres that are fitted are not off-road tyres they're not knobblies by any stretch of the imagination I went into a, an off-road area after it had rained quite a lot so it wasn't just off-road, it was off-road and mud and the front end just went low speed, that's probably doing 10 miles now so I came off and then that's when I learned that these bikes are blooming heavy I think they're about 250 kilograms and I had to lift it on my own because I was on my own just a pity as I said the GoPro disc decided to fail otherwise I would have uploaded that just so people can see what it was like for me trying to lift this thing fortunately I I looked at some YouTube videos because I know having been biking for 40 years that at some point I will drop this and I have to work on the assumption that I could be in the middle of nowhere on my own and I'm going to have to get it back up onto its wheels which is what I did a couple of days ago even in the slippy mud and stuff I used a technique where you it was on its left side full lock the handlebars to the right and then take the left hand bar, cup your hands round it and then just using your legs, the strength, lift it up still in gear because I've crashed it so it's not going to roll forwards or backwards got it up onto his wheels, composed myself and then had to walk it out the mud which did take a while because it just kept wanting to skip over to the side because it literally was like a bog and I got it back home and probably spent about two hours cleaning it no damage I've got crash bars I fitted them but if I ever do off-road again I am going to get go to an off-road school I've heard there's one in Norfolk which I have sent them a message and I think it's 280 pounds for a day but you use all their gear and their bike and again I think they're 
think they're BMW R1250s as well. So I might actually do that because I will come off and I'd rather come off on a bike where they expect you to come off as opposed to coming off on this because I would be a bit gutted if I damaged it and it will get damaged I'm sure but it's not something you want to do intentionally so let's talk a bit more about the 1250 um, the only things that I've added to it let me list them first things first was crash bars I fitted lower and upper crash bars lower ones were a given really because as everybody knows if you look down you can see how far the engine sticks out without crash bars if you come off even at a moderately low speed you run the risk of wrecking that so that was purchased before us even got the bike um, upper crash bars I decided to get them I, didn't, I was debating whether they were necessary I see that other people have them I thought right I'll get them because they're going to at least it's protection and then this off I had the other day in the mud well that they paid for themselves then so I bought some crash bars uh, I bought luggage because I've been camping in summer down the Cotswolds, Cherry Gauls, that sort of thing on this took loads of stuff including the tent and you could tour on it all day which I did I've been to Wales and it took all my stuff in it as well I bought a headlight protector bought a sat nav for obvious reasons you can't do what I used to do when I was a youngster before they had sat navs and stuff I had to memorise my route I'm getting too old for that stuff now so I bought a sat nav I bought a used nav 5 and it does everything for me uh, what else have I done I think the only other thing I've done is I've put and the CAN bus used to be there I've swapped that out and I've put in two USB connectors and that's to power my phone when I'm on tour power the GoPro because the GoPro battery is not brilliant and that's pretty much all I've done now my vlog hopefully I've got the right setup here you'll see it's a GoPro Hero 7 Black bought it off a mate who'd hardly used it I've got a chin mount from the company, I think they're actually called chin mounts I've seen them on Facebook, did a bit of research bought one from the company and I've, you get one which is helmet specific I have a Shui Neotech 2 modular helmet and it fits on that just below the mechanism you select to raise the chin bar it gets in the way slightly but I think it's a good compromise because I wanted it exactly where it is now because I think you get a better overall view I then bought the GoPro's external mic adapter I mean that was 50 quid I think I paid 100 quid for uh, the GoPro and a load of stuff and then I paid 50 quid just for the external mic adapter it's a lot of money and then what I've done is a bit of research on YouTube I've got a battery bank which was initially for the phone but I've taken the battery out of the GoPro and I've fitted the battery bank and I don't know how long it will last I think it's going to be significantly longer than the GoPro battery I know that for sure but I don't know what sort of time duration that will be Setup. I've tried it a couple of times, keep having little issues because I am rubbish with technology but as it stands at the moment it all appears to be working so GoPro Hero 7 Black got a 
sand disc which is um, a specific one and it now escapes me it's not the ultra don't get the ultra it's the other type there only is two so it's not the ultra uh, the external mic adapter and a lavalier mic with I think they call it a dead cat to reduce the wind noise and my intention is when I go to the Picos I'll do a little bit more vlogging but I'll also attach the GoPro to the bike I've already got an adapter on there it's going to be down here and then I can power it from the USB so we don't have to worry about running out of battery because I should imagine when we go out for the day we're probably going to be out all day and a GoPro battery uh, on the Hero 7 lasts 40 minutes or so ish and that's just not enough time uh, I've since found out because I, I, I learn a lot of stuff off YouTube from various people that the GoPro I think GoPro all of them are, regardless of which one it is but certainly the, the Hero 7 it will record in 10 minute-ish sections I think they're called chapters and I, that, that's to save data prevent loss and everything all that sort of thing so I've had to download a soft bit of software a video editing software on my computer at home and I think it's called VSCS or something like that so what you then do is you upload your footage and then you could have stitched them together and I have done it just as a test and I've managed to do it successfully If I'm still recording, I think I'm still recording. If I'm still recording. I'll do that. Take well this evening, and I'll try and get this footage all put together so that you won't see the joins. So I think basically there's not much else to say about the bike or vlog or me we could talk about the area we're currently in Felixstowe in Suffolk I've lived here for 30 years plus because Scotland's a beautiful country but the weather is key whether it's summer time or winter time you'll still wake up and the chances are it's raining and I doubt very much um, I'll be out or I would have been at my motorbike if I was in Scotland on the 1st of December as it is now apart from the fact that it's probably chucking it down in Port Glasgow where I'm from it's probably going to be snowing as well hence why I now live here And I learned how good East Anglia was when I was posted back from my second Gemini tour to RAF Watersham again on the Phantoms. I've never lived on base, just don't want to. I don't think my family, wife, children, I don't want to, I didn't want to bring them up completely cocooned in military life. I've always lived away from the camp. And I think if I was to give anybody advice, that would be the best thing to do be part of the community even when I was in Germany I lived about 15 miles from the camp in a little German town so posted back from Germany on my second tour to Watersham lived at Felixstowe I think it's about 28 miles from Felixstowe to Watersham so it's a bit of a trek in the morning to get to work <coughs> but the upside is you're in the community my wife managed to find a job, two daughters still live here with their own children 
they love it so much, enjoyed school, all that sort of thing, so a bit of a no-brainer. And I can pretty much ride this bike all through the year whilst living in East Anglia. Probably towards the end of December, January, February maybe, <coughs> we'll be out. Because we do get snow and bad weather down here. But I would expect that in January, February. I don't mind laying it up for that sort of time. There'll be an odd day where I could probably still go out in it. <coughs> in January and February, because it, it doesn't last the whole of January and February. But I kind of mentally write them off. And that's usually the time where I get involved in my bike build projects. I've just finished another GPZ900. I think this is my third or fourth I've done. I've restored um, a GS1000 a couple of years ago. Now lives in Spain. And I'll be looking out for my next project, which I think is going to be another GPZ900. Because once you've restored a few and gathered a bit of knowledge and experience, would be a shame to just do a completely different motorbike and not re-employ the same skills and techniques as well as the tools that I've bought. I would like to do an RD250 um, air-cooled and I did bid on one probably two or three months ago it was actually in boxes it had been partially done but it was in boxes disassembled and I got out bid at three grand that's how much money they command I think it eventually went for three and a half and considering it was in boxes that's phenomenal really isn't it I've seen them go on eBay fully restored for like seven eight plus thousand pounds oh it's ridiculous and I went to the Staffordshire bike show uh, a few weeks ago and there was one there which was quite good Nick to be honest even had some all speeds on it uh, and that was four and a half which I didn't think was too bad it, it was in good riding condition as was but I just thought What's the point? I buy it because I want to take it apart and, and do it up and properly get it restored. So if I spent four and a half thousand pounds and then undid what somebody had already done, I'd really just devalue it or lose money. I don't expect to make loads of money on my bike projects, but it would be foolish to lose money. I'd as well taking money out into the back garden and setting fire to it. <coughs> At the most, I'd be happy to do is break even as long as it went to a good home because when I do a bike it's a complete nut and bolt job and the fun is in the building not the riding because <coughs> whilst I love for example the GPZ900 it's still 30 plus years old technology normally aspirated carburetors which have issues um, normal suspension, not electronics, it doesn't adjust things on the move, all that sort of stuff, you really, it's the old, almost seat of your pants job. But I just like the look of them, and I enjoy the build. The last one I've done caused me the most amount of problems, because I think the engine was out about three times, because every time I put it back in, another fault would develop. But I've managed to get it to the point now where it's everything's working and it's looking really good.
lovely view of the sea and somebody off on their holes on the Stena. That'll be from Harwich, I guess. Really, 50 miles an hour. Right, quick demonstration of the low chassis for somebody who's only five foot six. Go back with ease. I would have actually struggled to do this on pretty much any of my road bikes. I can't believe how nice a day it is for the 1st of December. Might if you send a message to my mates in Scotland to ask them how wet and cold they are. Let's take the scenic route. Actually it looks quite nice, doesn't it? Don't think it's warm enough to sit outside for a cup of coffee these days.
Another good thing about the uh, GS, hill hold. Thank you very much. So hill hold, if anybody's not aware of it, get onto a hill, whether you're going up or down, press the front brake once, and the brake will stay applied when you take your hand off of it. And then you can either accelerate out of it, or if you manage to get the technique, which I think I've managed to perfect, as you depress the front lever twice in succession, and that will release the brake, and you're off. And what does surprise me about this motorcycle is, despite the fact that it weighs 250 kilograms, it's quite nimble, even at slow speeds. Although it does lull you into a false sense of security because you kind of forget how heavy it is and you might just do things on it which could cause it to tip over and I've learned myself they are bloody heavy and try to pick one up on your own isn't easy as well as your adrenaline's going because you've just dropped your bike I don't know what it would be like because I'm um, fast approaching 60 I don't know how long I'll be able to ride a motorbike of this sort of size and capacity if I think I'm going to drop it because riding a bike relatively easy and if you take a lot of precautions just be careful watch what you're doing all that sort of thing the chances of coming off are slim however it's always going to happen isn't it I think we all know that you could be the best rider in the world but it's somebody else that causes you to have it off and then it's about picking it up I'm not so sure I'd be able to pick it up in another 10 years but you never know at this moment in time I'm not going to let it put me off riding
right. Slightly unorthodox way of getting the padlock off. Only because I got my helmet on. And here we have the awesome GPZ 900R. ZX9R, upside down, inverted Fox with a ZX9R front wheel and mudguard. Converted handlebars, upright bars, new monoshock from Hyper Pro, I think it was. GPZ 1000 carburetors, ZZR 600 rear wheel. Few little modifications apart from that, it's box standard. Soon to be sold to make way for the next project, which is probably going to be another GPZ 900. I do like these bikes. Debating whether to MOT it and run it around for a couple of months, but we'll see. Right, goodbye.